Welcome to the Fierce Authenticity Podcast, where we're illuminating and dismantling all of the ways supremacy culture has impacted our relationships with ourselves, with source, and with others. Not just the overt ways, like racism, sexism, ageism, alcoholism, and all the other isms, but also the sneaky, cunning ways you wouldn't have thought of, like perfectionism, imposter syndrome, judgment, burnout, the not enoughs, and the hustle to achieve. I'm your hostess, Sharani M. Batuk, and I'm a relationship therapist, leadership development consultant, and author of the book series, Fierce Authenticity. Whether you're a returning listener or you're new here, I want to extend a very warm welcome to you and invite you to connect with me through the Fierce Authenticity newsletter community. If you're ready to rise above an inherited systematic invasion rooted in fear and lack so that you can calm and refocus those energies towards reclaiming a fiercely authentic personal relationship grounded in an abundance and love that is so radiant all your other relationships are elevated with you, then this is the space for you. I invite you to visit www.fierceauthenticity.com slash connect to join me. I'm so excited that you're here. And now let's dive in. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, I am so excited to introduce to you our very first international guest. So far, all of our guests on the podcast have been stateside, and today I'm really, really excited to share the conversation I had with my friend Shailaja Vishwanath. Shailaja is a blog, social media, and productivity coach with 14 years of blogging experience. Her website, Blogging and Social Media Simplified, aims to simplify the art of content creation down to easy to comprehend bites of information. Her intention is to help creators grow a loyal audience of engaged readers, clients, and customers while tapping into their passion. She conducts one on one coaching sessions and group calls together with courses and ebooks to help people find that special spark and ensure that they enjoy the work that they do. And now that might sound like Shyla Jha's work is only for people who are self employed business owners, entrepreneurs. And I want to let you know that her content, the information she puts out there, is not just for uh, people who are content creators or entrepreneurs, solopreneurs in business for themselves. Go follow her at Shailaja V on Instagram. All the links are in the show notes. And you will see she is talking about some powerful and amazing things. Things like, are you addicted to social media? And yes, that is coming from someone who has dubbed herself a social media coach. Um, She's also talking about just so many other beautiful things that are applicable to all of us across all areas of our lives. And her energy is so sweet and gentle while also keeping it very real. You know, come to think about it, I think that's why I like her so much because that's a lot of the ways that my energy can be as well, where it's very direct. And in our conversation today, Shaila Ja is shining a light on time affluence. Remember how last week we talked about everyday supremacy and how it shows up in our day-to-day interactions and how one of the ways supremacy shows up in us is that hustling grind is the achieve, 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 go, 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 and constant productivity slash (laughs) perpetual harvest. And so in today's episode, Shailaja and I are speaking to that theme as well as so many others. So sit back, grab a cup of tea, and enjoy this conversation that Shailaja and I had on this topic. And of course, as you are listening in, screenshot, 
share it on your stories, um, share it wherever you share your social media, and tag me in it so that we can have a conversation about what you are finding valuable from the conversation that we're having on the subject of time affluence. So without further ado, enjoy this conversation. All right, everyone, I am so excited to welcome our very first international guest, Shailaja. And I've already hyped up our conversation and read you her bio, but I just want to also give her an opportunity to say hello and welcome, Shailaja. I was so happy to have you here with us. Thank you, Sharani. It's an absolute honor to be here. And I'm so happy that you actually invited me because uh, I really appreciate the work that you do and uh, everything that you create. I'm a, I'm a big fan of that. And when we worked together, it was some, was in my mind. So to be actually invited on the podcast is a truly an honor. So thank you so much. To tell your listeners a little bit more about me, I'm sure, of course, the intro would have given them a clue. Uh, I'm a blog and social media coach, and I've been doing this particular business for a little over three and a half years now. And if I were to sum it up in one word, I would say it's because it's enjoyable. I just love the work that I do. I love connecting with people. I love helping them find a very organic way to connect with their audience and thereby build a business, a passion based on something that they enjoy doing day in and day out. First of all, I want to just acknowledge I'm over here scratching my head thinking what social media is fun Uh, because I have very much a love hate but mostly hate relationship with it. I know I've shared this with you in some of our other time together previously and I do also want to say just thank you so much for honoring and reflecting to me about my work. So thank you for that. And let's come back to this. How is social media fun? Please help me understand. Because as someone who uses it in my business, which obviously is what you do coaching in, it's really, I find it can be like, it just feels like having so much to do when there's already so much to do. I I totally get that. And as somebody who has been active on pretty much all of the big social media platforms that Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and Instagram, what I've realized over time is that The way we use social media has to be just from a space of authentic connection. And what I mean by that is we really shouldn't be focusing on the marketing side of it. Now, again, ironically, I do teach social media marketing. But even before that, the first thing I teach people is how to approach social media with intention. And by intention, I mean, you forget about things like the algorithm. You forget about things like getting getting the eyeballs of your potential customer. Because all of that puts, first of all, a huge deal of pressure on you as the creator, as well as on your potential audience. But if you just approach social media with the intention that, you know what, I'm just going to talk to a few friends. I'm going to just share my ideas out there. And whoever connects with it, those are my people. And I'm just going to build on that relationship. I'm going to build on that connection with them. And anything that happens as a result of that connection is a bonus. So I don't go into social media with the intention to sell, with the intention to market, or with the idea of grabbing a client. Mm -hmm. I go into social media, and now primarily I use only Instagram actively. Uh, I use it primarily as a way to just connect with my audience. And over time, I realized that when I moved away from the algorithm, the hacks, the hashtags, everything that tells you do this for more reach, do this for more visibility, do this for more, you know, being out there. I moved away from all of that. So when once I did that, it became easier for me to understand how to use social media with a very intentional, very comfortable approach. So I think that makes a huge difference. Yeah, and that's actually really nice to hear that. And I'm being reminded of uh, the fact that I do enjoy so many of your posts because they're not hardcore sales, right? They're very much informative and educational and they show your personality. And I do enjoy that. And I'm thinking about our listeners and how 
putting myself in the shoes of the consumer, gosh, just getting so many ads of people always trying to sell us something when we are scrolling just as a consumer on social media. And so that's really challenging. And I too find that on the consumer side, I do engage more with posts like yours, where it's more educational, informational, your personality is shining. And it makes me think of the, I heard once that you are supposed to be either attracting or repelling (laughs) at all times. Yeah. But the problem with that is, again, you're put into a position of pressure. Mm. Because when you are in the position of saying, I have to attract something or I have to repel something, you're in a position of what I call action and doing. What if we were to shift the narrative and say, I'm going to just be myself. So I love this quote, right? You are a human being. You are not a human doing. So why is that so important? Because the more we understand that just being ourselves is enough, the more our audience understands that too. And they can identify with us. They can relate to us. And they're able to see, oh, you know what? This is a person who's outside of the rat race. He or she is not following the hustle mentality. She's not doing this to get clicks, get eyeballs. She's doing it because she truly believes in the message that she's trying to convey to a wider audience. And again, the interesting thing, one of the things I keep telling my audience, and this is kind of a rhythm in my content, and that is try not to focus on followers. Try not to focus on the number of likes your posts has. Try not to focus on the number of times it has been shared. Because all of these are what I call metrics that don't matter. The metrics that do matter are how many true blue connections you are making. Mm. So let us say I put up a post, right? I put up a post about being a little mindful about washing dishes. Interestingly, that's a post of mine on Instagram, which has the best kind of quality engagement. And what I mean by that is, is every single person who sees a post, man or woman, comes and tells me, you know, I've never thought about washing dishes this way. That could be a mindful activity. It could be enjoyable. And what I look at, is the quality of the comments. What I mean by that is not the number, the quality. So if a person comments and says, you've given me a different perspective, you've made me think about how to approach dishwashing from a space of conscious attraction, conscious Mm -hmm. intention, instead of, oh God, I have to get through all these dishes again. (laughs) I mean, I, you know, dishes are there every single day. Laundry is there every single day. The world could be ending, but you'd always have dishes, you'd always have the laundry. And yes, that is a perspective that we've all kind of been conditioned to believe because it's also the very overarching narrative in the mainstream media. But I believe when we approach things with mindfulness, we go into things with the understanding that numbers don't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, connections matter more. Yes. And you said so many wonderful things in there, in particular about human beings, not human doings, right? And and what you're saying about that quality of connection. And I think that's one of the things that social media has has lost in some ways is the quality of connection. I just love that. And then coming back to that human being versus human doing. That feels like the perfect segue into our topic today, which is about time affluence. That post you wrote about time affluence, I was like, oh my goodness, this is a topic our listeners really need to hear, which as I'm putting the piece, as I'm speaking it right now, I'm almost like, this is actually funny that I'm speaking to a social media and blog coach about time affluence, considering that I just shared about how social media sometimes feels like such a suck and such a drain. And let's call it what it is. Sometimes it feels like a time suck and a time drain. And yet here you are. And we're about to dive into this idea of time affluence and what that really means. So tell us more about that. Oh, I'd love to do that. Time affluence is actually a term that I stumbled upon in this book by Ariana Huffington. It's called Thrive, the third metric to well-being and wisdom. And in it, she talks about how her mother, Ariana Huffington's own mother, was a person whom she associated with the term time affluence. Now, the term time affluence means that you have enough time 
to do everything that you need to do. So you're not rushing from task to task, to-do list to to-do list to chores. You're living every single moment of your life, every single day of your life, as though there is this expansive field before you. And you have time to wander, linger, savor the smells, savor the fragrance, just feel the grass underneath your feet. Now, figuratively, what does that mean for us, especially in a culture which seems to promote the more productive you are, the better you are as an individual. And here's the fun, you know, second irony that I would like to draw upon in today's episode. And that is, I am actually also a productivity coach. So I am a blog, (laughs) social media and productivity coach. And for the longest time, I've read books about productivity. And most of these are written by men. I don't know if you've noticed. So they don't really factor in a lot of what is called the invisible workload of women. You know, whether it comes to keeping a household running or whether it comes to maintaining your children's homework schedules and PTMs and all that sort of thing. So when I read Ariana's book, number one, I was happy that, yes, here was a woman and a successful businesswoman at that talking about the idea of time affluence and how she personally decided to slow down because obviously her and and the, the beginning of the book is pretty dramatic, you know, where she talks about falling off her bed and cutting her you know, side of her face on a table. It's also because of lack of sleep and things Mm -hmm. like that. And what happened when I reread the book, I read the book about four or five years ago. I reread the book earlier this year. And one of the things, like I said, that stood out to me was the idea of time affluence. So my understanding is what if we started approaching each day with the understanding that it's not like, oh, I have to do everything possible in the 24 hours before me, instead of which we say, I have this beautiful day ahead of me Mm. and I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to enjoy doing whatever I can and end the day with gratitude that I have so much time to do what I need to do. And I think that's important. Every individual has a choice to make the distinction between what they need to do and what they want to do. So most often our to-do lists are a combination of these two things. I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this. But I believe making that distinction is important because not all of your wants are urgent or important, (laughs) right? But things that you need to do either for your personal growth, your business, your home, these are things which will actually make you feel fulfilled at the end of the day. Mm. For instance, A typical day would be for me, one important personal task, one important professional task, and one important family-based task. If I finish these three tasks for the day, I've had a very fulfilling time affluent day. That is how I count it. So for instance, if I do my meditation and my workout for the day, I've fulfilled a personal goal. And what I've realized is when I decide that later in the day, when I have the time, I will work on some aspect of my business. I will either create a piece of content, I will reach out to a client, or I will do some kind of an outreach to a business contact such as yourself. That's a business goal done for the day. And then a family goal is something as simple as sitting with my daughter or sitting with my husband and having a discussion on something of importance, which is critical for us as a family. And therefore, what I realized was if I'm not packing my day with all of the things that the world tells me is important and instead circle back to what I believe is important for me personally, that's when time affluence really comes into play. Because otherwise, we're always going to be on this hamster wheel which says, have you done everything that the world asked you to do today? (laughs) A, that's impossible. That's not going to be fulfilling for you as an individual. And so once I stepped back from that hamster wheel, the days and the weeks just opened up for me. Mm. So I believe, I know I've kind of rambled over there, but I'm hoping I've been able to give you an understanding of what time affluence was. Oh, absolutely. And before we dive deeper into that, because I just heard so many rich pieces to that, I want to just reflect back to you. You just blew my mind when you said you focus on three tasks, but they're one from each major area that's important to you in your life, right? Because I've definitely heard of pick your top three things. And if you've done that, then that's great. And I've never thought to separate it out in that way. And I just 
I love that idea. And I'm going to apply that. I'm going to experiment with that and see how it is. Because that just feels, even hearing you say it, it almost feels like such a release from all the have to's, right? And this is where we're going to take it deeper. And I imagine our listeners also can feel a little bit of that release from, oh, all the have to's, right? Or the three things in every one of those categories. No, it's the one thing in each of three categories. Like, oh, I feel like I can breathe now. And, and that's where these have tos and what you were saying towards the end about like everything the world tells you that we're supposed to do. And that just is that supremacy conditioning that we have all internalized. And I think that's really important for us to name and was one of the main reasons I brought you on so that you can share with us about this topic and so we can shine a light on how that is supremacy cultures conditioning for us, right? That we're only productive, quote unquote, if we're creating some sort of product, end goal, something for someone else to consume. And that dehumanizes us on so many levels. And for our listeners, I just want to give them the background. So Shailaja actually lives in India. So we do share a similar background in terms of my ancestry comes from India. And so as brown people, we've experienced the same British colonization. I live in Silicon Valley. I see this day in and day out where I, I call it imported, where they import their workers still from places like India, where there's that tenacity to work really hard and be really productive. And they don't speak up. They don't speak out. And they'll just, yes, sir, whatever the boss needs, right? Like there's this energy of just being subservient to whatever it is that the boss or the world wants. And I'm just going to stop there because I can feel us dropping into a very deep space with this. <laughs> yeah. So here's the interesting thing, right? And you're absolutely right that the, the idea of supremacy, especially in mainstream culture, informs a lot of marketing speak, informs a lot of uh, cultural speak. So, for instance, a worker is deemed to be valuable at least as far as the world is concerned, based on the number of gold stars on their resume <laughs> or then the number of things they've achieved in a particular workforce culture. But the interesting thing with me personally, and I really have to credit my parents for this, is that we've always explored the idea of being and not doing all the time. Mm -hmm. And for instance, my background is I am a postgraduate. I'm an MA in English language and literature. I remember I had the idea that I wanted to pursue English language and literature in grade eight. And I remember telling my dad about it at the time. And, you know, I, and if you know the general Indian parent mindset, it's almost always towards science and engineering and, mm -hmm. you know, doctors and things like <laughs> lawyers and things like that. But my dad said, you know what, you do whatever you want to do. Now, obviously, at the eighth grade, you, your parents are expected to be indulgent of you and actually tell you that. But that turned out to be true. That turned out to be true that the older I got, it was getting firmed up more and more. And I remember in, in high school and then further ahead in, in undergrad, and then when I did my postgraduate degree, at no point did my dad say, or my dad recommend, would you like to try something which will make you more money? <laughs> it was always, will you do something which makes you happy? He said, if at the end of your postgraduate degree, you come back and tell me, you know what, I want to study further. I want to do even more with my life. I'll be ready to back you up there as well. So I believe even if we do live in a culture of supremacy, I believe a lot of things start at home. So if you are a parent or if you have a situation where you have the power to offer that kind of expansive comfort for your kids, I think that will shape a lot of who they want to be and what they want to be and not necessarily follow the dictates of marketing culture. And I remember we talked about this earlier as well. One of the reasons I could never get comfortable with the mainstream marketing is the idea of hustle culture. You have to be doing this. I, to, to put it very honestly, I'm not that kind of a go-getter, If the, the way the world defines it. I'm happy to just sit back and do the work that I do in silence and relative obscurity and let people find me if they need to find me. So I don't really, I don't believe in 
putting myself out there, putting myself in the limelight in that sense. But what I've realized over time is that so much of what we hear, especially in the marketing world, is informed by supremacy culture. So much of it, everything, think about it. Every single ad you see on your social media feeds or every third ad you see on your social media feeds is about how you can make six figures in six months. That is not only harmful, it's unrealistic, and it really promotes the idea that you have to be you know, working ridiculous hours to make that kind of money. That's the first challenge that I feel is the problem with supremacy culture there. The second challenge I find with supremacy culture is the idea that you have to be aggressive. You have to be macho. You have to be masculine. You have to do things to get ahead. Whereas I'm not sure if it is just the women. And to be honest, I wouldn't say it is. I think it's a mindset which should inform us, which says, do what you need to do and let the world find out about you at its own pace. My coach and mentor, George Cow, is, follows this principle, which is why I truly and deeply appreciate every piece of content that he puts out. But again, he's like a diamond in the rough, right? I mean, he's one of the few people who approaches marketing from the don't worry about getting more clients or more money or more visibility. Be happy with what you have. And that informs a lot of what I believe as well. Mm -hmm. And I am a huge proponent of the slow and steady culture. You grow at a very reasonable pace, but at a pace that feels comfortable and authentic to you. As an example, I have less than 150 people on my smaller list, email list, which is my marketing list. But that list is my most loyal fan base or subscriber base, as I would call them. You know, they are the people who will reach out and tell me, uh, there is this course which I'm interested in and I trust your judgment. So do you think I should pick it up? Do you have any feedback about the course creator? And if I have feedback, I'll be honest enough and tell them about it. But if I haven't, I'll tell them that as well. And I think. That relationship, that honesty is far more valuable than people who say, okay, grow your email list to 10,000 people in you know, 10 months. <laughs> well, you, of course you can grow your email list to 10,000 people in 10 months if you follow all of the hustling strategies. But at the end of the day, are you happy? Because I think happiness is a very integral part of who we are as individuals. And I don't, don't think we should sacrifice that at the altar of what I call supremacist or mainstream hustle culture. And it's so important to name and identify that, right? That hustle, that grind. And I liked how you said like that slow and steady, like you've really been enjoying your life slow and steady and being present with what is and enjoying and you didn't even use these words like of uh, gratitude or appreciating. I think that's also because of the overuse of the word. I think it's important, like you said, it's important, of course, to name things. For instance, I know a lot of people are uncomfortable with the word authentic because they feel it's been overused. You know, they feel, and, and to an extent, I agree. And the beauty about the English language is that there are so many words available to us, but then we kind of default into what are I call the more appropriate term. So I think there is an onus on us as well as creators to kind of bring the lesser known terms into the mainstream and make that the mainstream. So it doesn't have to be, it doesn't need to be hustle. It doesn't need to be, you know, chasing. It doesn't need to be heard. It can be connection. It can be the path of least resistance. It can be the path of true relationships with your audience. And that's something I love. I love my email list. I know that's a ridiculous thing to say, but I really love my email list because the most incredible emails land in my inbox every single day, especially now that I am not that active on social media over the last month and a half or so. Uh, every morning when I open my email, I get the most incredible emails. People saying I'm facing this challenge with my blog and I don't know what to do and what would you recommend? I mean, how many email marketers can claim that? How many people can say that, you know, I have clients who send me an email every single day? Where does that happen, right? Right. It doesn't unless you're doing things differently, 
Right. And this is where to wrap it all together, what you were saying in the beginning is that this undoing of supremacy culture really starts at home. And hello, welcome to Fierce Authenticity 2.0. Like you couldn't have marketed the next phase of my work in the world any better because that's exactly the message that I have been working on and couldn't understand how these different pieces of the puzzle played together. I've shared in other podcast episodes just about how I'm a relationship therapist. How is it that I was talking about supremacy and oppression and racism and all those things, right? And then, duh, it's because it's to talk about how supremacy culture has impacted our relationships with ourselves, with source, and with others. And how, yes, really in the dismantling of it, We have to start at home. First, our home, our body, internally our home, and then with our children, our spouses, our elderly even, right? Like really bringing that and starting at home. And that's how it gets to trickle out. And the fact that you're talking about doing things in a way that is just so counterculture, that is the rebellion, that is how we heal through. And in the first book, it's so funny. I kept calling it a revolution and like, welcome to the revolution. And now I'm like, oh, yeah, no, it really is <laughs> on such a, a whole other way. So I appreciate that, like that quiet revolution, the one that it's interesting because I the way I talk about this sometimes, I don't know if I've shared this on the podcast, but the way I've talked about it, especially with clients in one to one time is that supremacy culture is not going to be dismantled from the outside, right? It's going to be dismantled from the inside. And I sometimes refer to it like a Trojan horse. It's something that happens from the inside. And that quiet rebellion, that quiet revolution, that's exactly it. That's how it's going to happen. It's going to happen the slow boil that will topple the whole thing. And we won't even know what happens. It's going to take a while. But at least we're starting that now. And what a gift that in your family, your parents got to start that with you, right? In terms of not putting so much of that pressure on productivity and engineering or doctor or lawyer, right? But it was what is making you happy? What is going to fulfill you? What a gift. And now you get to pass that on to your own daughter. And I think that's the way it works when we do the healing, when we do the dismantling, starting at home, starting with ourselves and then extending it out to those closest to us. And there was something else that you said, how you were talking about that most marketing is built on that supremacist way of doing things. And I paid lots of money to one of those people who was teaching it that way who was advertising, like, do this and you'll get this, right? Like making all those big grandiose promises. And one, this person didn't deliver what they were selling. And, you know, I fell for it because I have been conditioned in the same way, like make all that money and, you know, all these other things and do this in your business and do that. And it wasn't until... The program was almost ending. I set up the entire launch structure just the way she said to do it and crickets. And as I sat there and I was so frustrated because I did everything to a T, all those crazy marketing emails, sending them all out, like doing all the things and not a single person signed up. And I'd even run the Facebook ads into the quote unquote funnel and all those things. And I literally, the day before the cart was closing, I sat there and I just was so frustrated. And I was like, why, God, why did this happen again? And I very clearly heard, because you have been doing it the colonizer's way. Oh my goodness, I still get goosebumps every time I I tell this story. And that's what helped me to finally see how, because the the irony is I was selling a program to support people with their own personal liberation and freeing themselves from some of this, right? And yet here I was marketing using the very same tactics. And that's just an example of how sneaky and insidious it is, is that here I am someone who is consciously aware of this actively doing my unlearning, and yet I fell for it. 
and was blind to seeing it in that realm. And then I, of course, got an opportunity to just sit and be and reflect and do what needed to be done or undone, be. <laughs> Actually, I needed to be so that all of that could be undone. And it's a continuous process of unlearning and learning and being so mindfully aware and catching myself when I fall into it. And it's one of those things where, to me, this is a practice that we have to cultivate because it's going to pop up at times where we least expect it. And so this is where having the awareness, knowing how it shows up in its very many forms, and then being able to teach it to our next generations and the next generations and the next generations and being an example and a model of what time affluence looks like and what that quiet revolution looks like and how we do things differently so that we can build these different ways of being these different ways of living, these different ways of loving and relating and really just being in such relationship is the word that's coming, like just being in right relationship with ourselves, with divine source and with everybody else in our lives, even if it's just the barista at the local coffee shop, right? Just how do we come into that? And it's by engaging in practices and having these awarenesses. Totally. I mean, two things that come to mind right now, especially after I heard you speak, one was pretty much exactly a year ago, I would say in June of 2020, is when I got to that tipping point. You talked about the realization in your situation. So in the middle of June of 2020, I had enough of the hustle mentality. I had tried all the tricks in the book. I had followed all of the tactics and all of the strategies and all of the hacks, which is another reason I tried not to use any of those words in my <laughs> own marketing. And I again, I saw crickets. I wouldn't say I wasn't getting clients, but the clients who were finding me and being with me were people whom I had built up over time, not people who were finding me due to a single Facebook ad or to a, due to a single email blast. And that's the first thing that happened. I said, enough is enough. And then pretty much the next two weeks, this happened in mid-June of last year. And then the next two weeks, I spent single-handedly unsubscribing from every single marketer mm -hmm. who, whose newsletter I had signed up over the last two years. And believe me, there were a lot. There were mm -hmm. over 35 or 40 people. And I said, I'm going to just start over. And then towards the end of June is when I came upon George Cow. So it was very symbiotic, uh, you know, a synergistic happening. I didn't plan on it. So it happened in that sense. And over the past year, every connection I've made, whether it's through my blog or my email list or my social media channels, is has been informed by this conscious connection. You know, the idea of mm -hmm. connecting truly with people where they are at and not expecting anything out of it. And earlier this, this rather, yeah, earlier this month, we are still in June and we're recording this, is when I embarked on a 60-day social media sabbatical. So I'm currently off social media. I will be off it until August this year. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that was mainly as an experiment in the sense, is it possible to not only have a business, but thrive reasonably without being active on social media, without marketing yourself in every way, shape, or form. And there have been some interesting insights that have emerged. What I'm doing is right now, I'm journaling it every single day, and it's on my website. I can share the link with you later, which you can probably put in the show notes. It's a process. I'm realizing that unless we stay open to the process of learning and evolution, we're never going to step out of the culture that says, you have to be on social media in order to market your business. And I don't think that's necessary anymore. I, I may have thought differently even up to six months ago, or maybe a year ago. But just the last month has told me that if you have a connection with your readers, with your audience, they will reach out and find you. So you no longer need to go out there, you know, Put yourself in the spotlight, especially if you're not comfortable with it, which is difficult for a lot of introverts. And a lot of my audience are introverts as well. So if I were to tell them, hey, you know, get on video and put your face out there. Say, okay, I'll do it if you want me to, but I'm not really comfortable doing this. And 
I understand now. And so it's not a question of one size fits all. Maybe the hustle marketing culture works for some people, but what a lot of people don't understand is that the reason the hustle marketing culture doesn't work is because everybody's doing it. We're not fools, right? The audience is not a fool. The audience understands when you're doing something as a marketing tactic versus when you're doing something because you truly believe in it. And that comes through in the content, that comes through in whatever you're creating, whether it's a video, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a blog post, whether it's an Instagram caption, it comes through because ultimately the audience knows, hey, this person is there doing it because they believe in it, not because they're trying to sell me something. Mm -hmm. And I think that should be the core of all marketing. That should be the underlining basis of your marketing. Not go out there, do this, get your clients. Show up, be yourself, and let's see what happens. I, I think that's a far better approach to marketing. <laughs> I, I'm chuckling over here because it's almost like you're giving the subtitle of my first book, which was show up, be seen, get love, right? Because it's another way we have been conditioned by supremacy culture is to not show up, is to not let ourselves be seen, to not cultivate relationships based on exactly what you said, which was meeting people where they're at and not having any expectations. That is so counterculture. All of this is so counterculture. And I appreciate how you spoke about like the shifting of culture and how it works just little by little. It's almost like all of a sudden I think of the saying, like, how do you move a mountain? And it's like one spoon at a time. <laughs> That's how you move a mountain is just the tiny littlest bit at a time. And yeah, so I just think that's beautiful. And thank you for telling us about your social media sabbatical, because I was going to ask about that. Because again, the irony of being a social media and blog coach, so the blogging part you're still doing, but to be a social media coach and then taking a social media sabbatical. Right. So I wanted to also just ask about what the experience has been like. I heard you say that you've written some blogs on it. We'll definitely share the link in the show notes. And if you were to give just one to three top highlights, what would you say? I would say the first top highlight would be the idea of time influence. Ex affluence expands so much more than what you would actually <laughs> anticipate when you stay off social media. Mm -hmm. And I say this as a social media coach. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but hear me out. So the first thing I want people to understand is when you step back from social media, when you step back from the validation, when you step back from the comparison game, as I call it, there is so much more potential for you as a creator. You stop worrying about, okay, how many people saw my last post? Mm -hmm. Okay, how many people left a comment? How many people sent me a message on you know, Facebook or Instagram? And how many people do I still need to get back to? There is this entire, I would not even say pocket, I would say there is an entire waistcoat and jacket of time that opens up in the fabric of your day. It's just so much time. It's incredible. And I used to think I was pretty good at managing my social media time, but not using social media at all is a completely different ball game. So that's the, that's the first tip I would like people to at least give it a go. You don't have to do 60 days like me. You can just do two, just a weekend. You can try a weekend away from social media just to see what happens. The second thing that I have realized as far as stepping back from social media is concerned is to allow myself to fall back into the lap of obscurity as a creator. I remember 14 years ago when I started blogging, I literally had one person reading my blog and that's my mom. And your mom's <laughs> going to like everything that you read anyway, right? I mean, whether it's absolute <laughs> crap, <laughs> pardon my French, it's really the gold standard. She's going to say, you know what? I love what you did. It's great because your moms are like that. But when you create an obscurity, it allows you to explore certain realms of creative possibility that don't actually happen if you were to put it out there for the social media public to consume. I think that's important. I think that's extremely important for people to do. The third thing that I have learned is, especially with my daily journaling practice, and, and I'm putting it on the public domain on my website, my daily journaling practice helps me understand how many more things I have to value in my day. 
for instance i've been married 20 years this may and it was only in the last year and a half that i actually started to enjoy cooking and this is one thing i will say i was kind of influenced by supremacy culture in this one aspect it has nothing to do with the way i was brought up but it was this expectation that i needed to be good at cooking because i was the woman of the house i'm supposed to have the... i love cleaning i never used to enjoy cooking you give me you know a bucket a mop a washcloths and dusting cloths and i'll go to town and I, i can clean day in and day out and i wouldn't complain one bit but put me in the kitchen for a few hours and i'm like oh god when do i get out of this place i'm done i can't stand for more than 20 minutes in the kitchen but here's the interesting thing that happened once i had this time opening up not just due to the sabbatical but even before that in the thanks to the lockdown and the pandemic and things like that i started exploring cooking from the perspective of a student and from the perspective of an experiment and when that happened i started to enjoy cooking so now and this is so strange to people who know me especially my parents my sister and when i tell them i tried out this dish today i tried out something else i tried this and i is this you you know is, are you sure somebody else hasn't taken over your body <laughs> <laughs> so i think what happens is, and when when i journal it that's what i realize you start to value so many little things in your for instance when i get up every morning i have this entire 10 or 15 minute time completely to myself to meditate and i give myself to that time completely i'm not worried about okay how many emails do i have to respond to this morning or how many comments on social media are waiting for me so there is a sense of freedom that descends on you when you give yourself this gift of time and i think all of us deserve that it's 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 not something it's not something we need to fight for or scramble for we owe it to ourselves every single day and whether or not we like it social media is us being subservient to other people's time it's a fact oh it is a fact it is oh that's good yeah that is good I just need to sit with that one for a moment. <laughs> But social media is us being subservient to someone else's time. And this is true whether we're creators or simply consumers. Absolutely. Because when we are creating content, there is always that small bit of us that wonders, even if we are not attached to the outcomes. There's always a small bit of us that wonders, did this reach my audience? Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I am planning to implement especially when I come back to social media in August this year is to number one dial back on the amount of content that I put out on social media and to ask people to be even more intentional with the way they engage with my content so in other words don't feel compelled to like my post just because you saw it i want you to sit with the information that you see take your time to process it but nothing that i'm putting on social media is do or die situation nothing that i put out there is a you know do this right away or you're going to miss out on something there's no scarcity mindset <laughs> and in any case i don't follow that so allow the information to come to you when you are ready not the other way around mm. when we put ourselves on social media especially as consumers we are telling somebody else that i'm here start feeding me all of those bites of information whereas mm-hmm. when i show up with the intention to learn something i go straight to that one person whose word i trust whose judgment i believe mm. in and i read what they and here's the interesting thing when we approach it in that way we don't have to agree with everything that the person says i could be a friend of yours or i could be a student of yours but it doesn't mean that i follow every single thing that is where healthy debate can emerge i love it when my students get back to me and say i like what you said but this is what i disagree with and i <laughs> i welcome that because without that without healthy debate we are going to be in a position of what i call false validation hmm. then you are not a leader you are building a cult <laughs> <laughs> right mm-hmm. we don't want we don't want yes men and yes women right we want people who get up and say I like this but I'd like to challenge you on this one thing you spoke about is there another way we can discuss this that's healthy disagreement that's healthy debate that's staying open to discussion 
but if you are always in mindless consumption mode as i call it you're just going to say oh a post from so and so let me just hit the like button you've not read it you've not processed <laughs> it you've not had the time to actually see if you agree with it and therefore you're feeding the social media beast because all the social mm-hmm. media bots see is that you like so and so's post you mm-hmm. like three of that person's post so let me show you that same person's post the next time and you can't blame the algorithm because it's built by a machine <laughs> <laughs> and it's built on your behavior of mindlessly scrolling and double tapping the the post. Exactly, which is why my course itself, one of the courses of mine itself is called Intentional Instagram. I don't want you to come to Instagram to say, okay, I'm going to post A B C D E and then on fifth day I'm going to get land a client. You know, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> and it shouldn't work that way because if it were that easy everybody would do it. right if i were to give you a blueprint and say post 6 days a week seventh day you will be filling your client calendar that doesn't make sense and it shouldn't make sense because that means you're trying to follow somebody else's blueprint my whole idea with my courses and my content and everything is to tell people this is what works for me try it out let me know if it works for you and if it doesn't please get back to me because we can figure out okay mm-hmm. what is it that worked what was it that didn't and maybe we can thresh out something different for your specific audience so i think that's important to keep in mind yeah and i appreciate how we were talking about time affluence and how even being a conscious consumer because what i just heard was a lesson in being a conscious consumer because even as consumers were always being told oh yeah this is another thought i was having earlier in the podcast when i could not remember but how even as consumers were constantly told we're not enough or do this thing the way i've done this thing and you're going to have this thing right and for a lot of people it's the diets the exercises and that's the big thing that supremacy culture and patriarchy especially for women has taught us that we have to look a certain way we have to be a certain way in your case even just that deeply embedded conditioning of or i have to show up as a dutiful wife and cook i mean i've had that one i'm impressed that you love to clean because i hate cleaning uh, and i'll cook as long as i don't have to clean afterwards my dream is i'll get to experiment in the kitchen and i'll have someone to come clean up after me but it's just that we're always being told we're not enough and so we're always being sold something to help make us more but that more or enough is constantly moving the goal post for that is constantly moving and that is what supremacy culture does because it never wants us to achieve the goal it never wants us to attain it because guess what when we achieve the goal or when we attain the goal we'll eventually wake up and see that we're a cog in the supremacy machine and then we will do what's necessary to un to dismantle that supremacy machine right and so that is why the it is always moving. And so I just love how time affluence and and conscious being a conscious consumer have just come in together. And thank you for sharing your top two lessons with us about the fact that like not having to focus so much on social media on your sabbatical like all of a sudden you've had so much more time affluence. Exactly. And on so many different levels because then you're also not slave to the machine. Mhm. Yeah. Well said. Oh, Shailaja, I just feel like this is a a really good spot for us to start wrapping up and before I invite you to share uh where our listeners can find you, are there any final words that you would like to leave our listeners with? I think the world can use more people like you and the work you do, Shirani, because I believe that the more we put the spotlight on connection and authenticity and like you said moving away from supremacy culture i believe these conversations are very important to have not just with other people but with ourselves if i have to say one more thing especially to those of your listeners who are business owners it would be don't start a business for the money because if you are to start the business for the money like shirani said that goal post is always going to be moving you're always going to say oh i made x 
in you know january and i made 2x in april and then i made 3x in june that means i can make 6x in a few months if i keep pushing myself a little <laughs> further and while that is not necessarily untrue it's not necessarily healthy either mm-hmm. because you're always going to be looking for the next best thing so i would say you are perfectly and wonderfully you right where you are and please keep having these conversations both with yourself and with other people and start slowly breaking down the shackles of marketing from the macho perspective and move into more heart based market Oh, I love that. And for any of our listeners who are not uh, entrepreneurs, the same is true. It's not about having to hustle for that next thing, that next title, that next whatever, right? Like, just be. Absolutely. Just enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. Because that makes the journey so much more enjoyable and special and connected. Well said. Shailaja, where can our listeners find you? How can they connect with you? I know you also have a podcast actually. And by the time this episode launches, you'll definitely be out of your sabbatical. That's for sure. So where can our listeners find you? So my website, that's shailajav.com. That is the primary place where you can connect with me. And as Shirani said, I also have a podcast. It's called Intentional and Creative Affluence with Shaila Javi. And uh, apart from that, my most active social media channel, when I become active, will be on Instagram. Same name, Shaila Javi. So these are like the top three places that you can find me. My website, of course, has the links to my other uh, social media channels. And of course, my newsletter. You're welcome to sign up for that. And I, and as I tell my newsletter subscribers, I never try to sell you anything unless you specifically ask for it. So <laughs> my newsletter is very different from the ones you may be used to. Yes, and this is very true. I have seen that and noticed that about you as well. And so just thank you for joining us. Thank you for your kind words and reflections for me and also for all of the wisdom that you shared with our listeners today about how they can take back their time and not be a slave and bound by these shackles in this machine. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I know it's like seven in the morning for you and seven in the night for here for me when we made this conversation possible. And I'm just really grateful. So thank you for being here with us today. Thank you so much, Shirani. Like I said at the beginning, this has been an absolute honor. And thank you for letting me ramble. I think we went on and on. And given how we've been talking, I think we can go on for another hour as well. (laughs) Yeah. And and then that's why I hand select every guest that I invite. I it's really important to me that the guests that I introduce our listeners to really bring this heart centered, connected approach. And that it's really valuable because time is the one resource we don't get back. (laughs) That is true. That is true. Absolutely. And that's the thing I would like to end the podcast on. And that is to understand that, yes, although we don't get time back, the time we have right now is precious. And I realize that still creates a sense of pressure in people. So my recommendation, especially from the perspective of time affluences, instead of thinking, I only have this day, Tell yourself, I have this whole day in Mm. front of me. It's a very slight reframing, but it allows you to truly tell yourself, if I have the next 12 hours or 14 hours ahead of me, what will I focus on today? And how will I make it matter to me individually? So on that note, I would like to end. And once again, thank you so much, Shirani. And this has been an honor. And I look forward to the listening to the episode whenever it is live. Yes, thank you. What a beautiful place to end. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I want to take a moment to honor and acknowledge the amazing support team that helps make this podcast possible for you. Starting with Diego Velazquez, our podcast editor and the talented artist who created our custom music. Ana Olvina, my wonderful assistant who creates all of our beautiful graphics and the transcript of every episode, which you can find over at www.fierceauthenticity.com. 
Biana Sandich, who writes our amazing show notes and does it so well that I bet you couldn't tell it wasn't me. The talented Jillian at Epoxy Studios, whose photography is our cover art and pretty much every other curated image that you see of me on social media. My husband, who puts up with me when it's 11.30 p.m. on a Sunday night and I'm like, hey babe, I gotta record a podcast episode. Like, right now. Is that okay? My higher power, whose divine wisdom flows through me to bring these messages to you. And last but not least, I want to thank you, my listener, so much for listening in. If you'd like to join the podcast support team, some ways you can do so are by rating and reviewing the podcast, sharing it with everyone you know, and, if possible, making a financial contribution through the link in the show notes so that you, too, can be part of the team elevating this podcast and making it possible to bring to other listeners like you. I'm sending you so much love, and we will be together again soon. Mm-hmm.